Well, official welcome and good morning. Thank you again for joining us for this next session of the Leadership Behavior DNA webinar series. Uh, this one is entitled The Art and Science of Self-Coaching, Understanding Behavior in Yourself and Others with our special guest, Deanne Turner. Lee and Hugh are gonna introduce Deanne in a moment, um, but we're so glad to have her with us on this special topic. Uh, and she have, she'll have a lot of insight and input on how to self-coach. And so uh, again, if you're, this is your first um, event with us, um, thank you for joining us. Um, Lee Ellis and Hugh Massey have spent most of their careers uh, teaching people how to use the uh, topic of natural behavior in leadership development and working with clients and customers. And so this is a continual webinar series on this topic of, of behavioral management, behavioral using behavior to for development and leadership and team development. So Lee and Hugh, thank you again for sharing your wisdom today. And we appreciate your uh, taking time with this audience to uh, talk about this important topic of self-coaching. Uh, and then Lee, uh, one housekeeping item, uh, audience, if you would like to ask a question during the event, please familiarize yourself with a Q&A button on your Zoom taskbar and just enter a question at any time during the event. We'll try to get to that either during and or near the end of the event and ask and answer your questions. So please uh, ask any questions that you feel may come up to you and we'll try to answer those. So with that, Lee, Hugh, Lee, uh, let's, let's start together. Would you, would you and Hugh kind of set up the topic for today and then <coughs> introduce our special guest, Deanne? Yes. You know, this idea of self-coaching, uh, you don't read too much about it. I don't know how I came into my world, but I've been coaching for 22 to 25 years now, coaching leaders. And I always tell them that my real goal is to work myself out of a job because my goal is that they become uh, so sufficient in self-coaching, they don't need me anymore. So I try to prepare them for that. I think some of that comes from my background in the military and especially as an aviator where we plan our mission, we go out and fly it, we come back and debrief it. And that debriefing part is so important. And self-coaching really is you're kind of debriefing yourself in the moment you may have anticipated some things you need to work on and you're working on them in the moment, but it's also uh, being able to coach yourself on how to correct back on course or how not to do something that might not be the best thing to do at that moment. Well, being a pretty spontaneous person, uh, self-coaching has been very important for me. It's always been a challenge. I have uh, so many uh, little issues to coach myself on that I'll be coaching for the rest of my life. And of course, my wife and Hugh and others that are around me, they appreciate that. And sometimes I wish I was self-coaching a little more, I'm sure. But the whole idea is to continue to grow. And I know Hugh has been a big portion of that, a big uh, believer in that for a long, long time and coaching and self-coaching. And Hugh, would you comment on that? And we'll, then I'll introduce Deanne, uh, our guest today. And we're thrilled to have you with us, Deanne. It's just an honor to have you here and let Hugh say a word and then I'll bring you in. Well, Lee, being spontaneous and uh, in which you're spontaneous, and I'm less spontaneous, but I'll try and be spontaneous for a moment. You used that word uh, as you're introducing yourself. And I just want to make a comment that being spontaneous is a real strength. And, and as a leader, it's very important because as a leader, we're all going to make mistakes here and there. Um, and, we, and as you said, we need to self-correct. And if you are spontaneous, it's easier to self-correct. And probably going to be, if you're self-aware and you respect the other people around you, it's going to be easier to admit your mistakes. And, and so I think that's something that's, you know, very important to, to recognize, you know, as, as a leader. So I just wanted to, to, to say that in your favor, Lee, uh, because spontaneity, I think it's something that's really, really important, but sometimes we don't celebrate it enough because it's associated with being disorganized. But really, if you look at it as a, as, as a great strength, um, you know, you, you can course correct. And that's a lot of what we're talking about today. And, and I know my greatest learning experiences as a leader have been, um, have, have really come, come, come to fruition when I felt the energy in a conversation change. And, and I've sort of felt I'm up against a brick wall and I know, okay, I, I've got to do something spontaneous here. I've got to adapt in some way. And I have to, 
and, and I bring it back to communication and, and you know, with that greater self-awareness, and if you understand the, the other person around you, you can course correct on your communication if you're noticing uh, that you've come into that brick wall and you're not getting through to them because your energy's been drained and so is theirs. So I'll, I'll leave it at that to, to start with. So a lot of my comments today might be around energy flows because I think that's when you know that you've got to self-correct. Hmm, very good. Well, Deanne, uh, I know that this is an area that you've spent some time thinking about, but uh, Deanne is, uh, I just got to tell everybody what a great person she is and what a great experience she had. She was a, uh, the first woman to be an officer in Chick-fil-A organization nationally, internationally, the first woman to have that role. She's been the VP of talent and uh, also of uh, sustainability there. And she's just so highly regarded in that field, but also in the Atlanta community and now really around the world. She's been to New Zealand, Australia, all over the US and she's speaking. The thing that's uh, amazing about her is she has two books, one that came out a few years ago uh, called A Bet on Talents. And that was a great one, just we loved that one. Now her most recent one that just came out a few months ago is called Crush Your Career. Now, in my notes that I sent to uh, Deanne, I said I already bought two copies. Well, now I'm up to six copies. I bought copies for my kids, my grandkids, and giving them away because uh, I looked at it right away and read it right away. And it's so powerful. It's not just for those starting out, although it is kind of strongest for them, but it's also for all of us about the things that we need to be thinking about as leaders and to help us continue to grow. So Deanne, we're delighted to have you with us today and to have your insights because we know that you have real expertise here and we're so happy to have you here to share it with us. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be with you all today, Lee. Well, Deanne has uh, already helped us in a lot of ways. Uh, she has, uh, we videotaped her in some of the, her comments about getting clarity and collaboration at Chick-fil-A that we use in our online course. And she provided some great insights there. Well, as we think about it uh, today, you know, we think about self-coaching requires self-awareness and all that sort of thing. But Deanne, how, what was the first point in your life in your role as a leader manager when you really realized that Maybe you didn't know everything and maybe you needed to grow a bit. And so <laughs> could you share something about that? There were actually several points. It took a little while to get there because, you know, we do start off sometimes thinking we know a lot if we're not, if we're not wise from a young age. And um, I think about a number of places, but the first place that it really hit me that I needed to make a change as a leader was when I became a parent. Um, now, I, was a, I started out in leadership pretty young because uh, I was already in leadership when I became a parent at age 26. And I had really high expectations of those people who worked with me. In fact, I look back, I was editor in chief of our high school newspaper. And I look back to those poor people who worked with me on that newspaper staff because I expected perfection in everything. I ex and most importantly, I expected it of myself, which was where the real problem started, right? And so I had really high expectations of my staff that worked for me. And when I became a parent, it really changed my thinking because as I held this, you know, innocent little boy in my arms, I realized that everybody who worked with me was somebody's son or daughter or somebody's mom or dad or somebody's brother or sister. And that I wanted the people I wanted my, uh, I, I needed to treat them the way I wanted those special people in my life treated. And so it really gave me this idea of, okay, you've got to extend grace to yourself, Deanne, first, and then you've got to start extending more grace to others. And um, I focused more on excellence than perfection after that point. Wow. Was there any one particular event that kind of caught your attention as you were uh, a young leader that, that you kind of, it kind of used as a point of emphasis to help you remind yourself that maybe it's like he was talking about the energy shift that happened there. Well, usually all I had to do was, you know, get up in the morning and get that baby ready to go and later two more of them uh, and drop them off and do all that, you know, um, like the Marines do more before 6 a.m. than most people do all day and, and spend that time with them. 
and then, um, you know, to go into the office and go, okay, these are very special people in the lives of other people. And I'm going to treat them the way I want my sons to be treated today or my husband to be treated today uh, mm -hmm. by other people. And so, um, you know, I, I think about, I had some really courageous team members from time to time um, that gave me feedback and just out of confidentiality, I won't share the exact details, but had a young man who came in to see me and it, it really, he came in and took great courage, great courage to come in and tell his boss what he told me that day. But he needed me to know that my high expectations, the impact it was having on him personally and on his family. And when I recognized that and went back to my whole principle of, wait a minute, you know, I don't want my son treated that way by somebody. So I'm going to, I'm going to treat him differently. And I, I, that really helped me just to um, think in those terms of making it very personal about the people most important to me in my life. You know, that's a, a great point because then he made you aware. And so that kind of, I'm sure that's a pretty significant event and therefore it kicked, it kicked you into high gear on more self-awareness. So maybe I need to be aware of what, how I'm coming across to others. I think that for me has been one of the big things is how am I coming across to others? So I think it's, uh, you said another thing there is your awareness about your attitude towards all your people. It came from your role as a mother and how you looked at your son and you wanted others to, uh, you wanted to look at others in a certain way, but you, you indicated you were kind of coaching yourself from there on out to have that kind of an attitude. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was just a, that was a daily reminder. And again, I could get some feedback um, that would help me. And it was, you know, you, you talk about this idea of self-awareness, which um, I, I write about that in Crush Your Career because it took me a lot longer to get that. And I recognize now if you're going to crush your career, that's something, you know, going right into it, you need to have a better insight about self-awareness. And, you know, we think about uh, as we're, as particularly when we're younger, because we have less experience, we think about, well, people understand my intent because that's really what self-awareness is, right? The, it's the, the gap between what we intend and what our actual impact is. Mm -hmm. And so I would have all these great intentions. I mean, I, you know, I had a good heart and not recognize that no matter what I intended, sometimes the impact was very different. So I'll give you an example. This is a small example, but I thought, because I had an open door policy and I really did. I, I was one of those leaders who I told my team, whenever you need me, if you, you can email me, you can text me, you can call me, you can come in my office anytime except when I was interviewing. That was the only time. Um, you can interrupt me if you need me. And so I thought I had covered all the bases. I had made it really clear that I was available. And one day, another courageous staff member said, well, what you don't get is it'd be nice if you'd come and sit down in one of our offices one day and that you'd come into our open door, into our world and visit. And I had never thought about it that way. I thought I was being completely accessible. So, and you just don't have any idea the impact those decisions make on other people until you really explore that and um, explore this whole idea of self-awareness and you know, what is it that I'm missing? What are those blind spots? And that's a hard thing to self-coach on. You really need other people um, in that case, uh, giving you that, at least that initial feedback so that you can continue to self-coach yourself once you've learned it. Yeah. So you're a pretty strong person, pretty strong personality, I think. So how, I think you kind of covered a little bit, but a little bit more. How did you build that level of trust where they felt safe coming to give you that feedback. Cause a lot of people don't feel safe to go to their leader, even good people leaders and to give them that kind of feedback. How, what kind of, how did you set about creating that atmosphere? Well, as a leader, one of the things we have to do is be vulnerable enough with our own mistakes. And so I, you know, sometimes I was probably too open and too um, honest and too trusting actually, and throwing things out there for the, the team but I really tried to be clear. You know, if I made a mistake, I talked about that mistake. I owned it, um, especially if that mistake impacted them. But I tried to make that, to have that kind of environment so that um, they would feel comfortable coming. And the other thing we have to do as leaders, and again, 
this was learned over time, Lee. I, I did not come out of the blocks with this, but you have to ask. You, you know, if you could plan every day to ask one question of feedback by somebody on your team, then you would constantly have the information you need to self-coach yourself better. Um, mm -hmm. If you just put that into your daily plan, I'm going to ask about this issue with at least one team member today and, and practice that every single day, you'd have a lot more information. And so I think first being vulnerable with your own mistakes, with your own um, and putting that out there. And then I think secondly, you build trust by asking um, for feedback. Good. Well, Dan, in my years of work that I've done, and you can comment on this too, I see that uh, it takes a lot of inner confidence to be vulnerable like that. So that's a pretty healthy person. Uh, sometimes we're working with leaders that are not healthy enough to actually be vulnerable and to be honest with themselves about self-coaching. It's too scary. It's uh, their doubts, their fears, their shames cause them to be more protective and not be okay to be vulnerable. And to me, that shows a lot of your inner confidence and belief in yourself. So you probably have less baggage than some folks have from growing up. You have that more of that unconditional love that gives you that self-confidence. Is that probably true? Actually, no. And you didn't know I was going to say that. Um, I would tell you that in my case, um, and, and I don't know how this fits in with what you intended for me to say, Lee, so okay. this is a total surprise to you too, but it's sort of a fake it till you make it. And um, I didn't, I actually didn't have that confidence. I didn't have that confidence when I went to Chick-fil-A, which would shock Chick-fil-A people that are watching this right now. They'd say, oh yes, you did. I really didn't on the inside. That level of perfectionism was a childhood thing. And I carried that right into my leadership and um, was the thing that I, I mean, that was why it was so great for my life when I finally figured it out is because that was a life issue, not a leadership issue. Mm -hmm. It just bled into my leadership. So um, for me, in that case, I would say it was, uh, you know, you you push through until it actually does become who you are. It yeah. may not be when you start, but um, you you just have to push through it until it becomes who you are. Well, this is probably not on, what's on our list of things to talk about today, but I got to push one more button here. So what you just described is one of the things we talk about is acting your way into a new way of feeling. And quite often leaders have to learn to act their way into a new way of feeling. The other thing, though, is that uh, uh, your, your awareness, your situational awareness, it was coming along. And then as you saw how it was paying off for you, you became more interconfident, more interconfident. But here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking you probably had some leaders that believed in you that helped you believe more in yourself. Is that true? Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And I think that's true of most people who uh, grow in their leadership. And I think about two very different situations. Um, so the first one, was Jimmy Collins. Jimmy was the president, longtime president, first non-family president of Chick-fil-A. And from the time I was really young in my career, almost immediately, he began supporting me, championing me, sponsoring me, and certainly mentoring me. Um, but one of the interesting things Jimmy did, some people think of mentors and sponsors and champion is that you're kind of the teacher's pet, if you will. Well, mm -hmm. that's not the case at all. Those are the people who hold you most accountable. And so um, that was one of the great things Jimmy did for me was hold me accountable um, at, every, at every point and um, help me grow tremendously. But, what, but because he held me accountable, that actually helped me grow in my confidence. When I got through some of those difficult situations, one story I've started telling recently because he and I talked about it recently and he said it was okay for me to share it. But one of the stories that I've told recently was the time he threw me out of his office. And um, that, you know, if you can't gain some confidence after surviving being thrown out of the president's office, that that will give you some confidence. Um, but he held me accountable for a situation. And then um, and then he said, I'd like for you to leave now. And I sat there for a moment. And he said, no, I mean, I'd really like you to leave. And I realized what he was doing because he was my mentor. He didn't want to say things that, you know, were going to crush me at the moment. And he was pretty angry. It was a misunderstanding and we worked it all out. Um, you know, it became a question if I had done something, uh, I had made a decision without his authority. And I really misunderstood the authority I had. And 
he was questioning, did I have the integrity for a future leader at the company? And so that was a real turning point. Um, that was one type of encouragement to build confidence as a leader. And then I think about another leader I had, the next president of the company that I reported to. And, and uh, Tim did something to really help me with the self-awareness part as well. It was about midway through my career. And he said, I don't know what your, I think about, was about 10 years into my career, about a third way through. He said, I don't know what your morning routine is like, but you know, when you get here, you need to be sure that you are 100% ready to go optimistic and positive with your team. That was his way of telling me I had not been that way. He was, he didn't give you negative feedback. He just made suggestions about um, how with positive feedback. So that was another opportunity for self-coaching because you have to step back and go, okay, my boss just gave me some quasi feedback. Like he didn't really come out and say it, but what was he saying there? So I did that self introspection of that. And one of the things he suggested was how I spent my mornings. And, you know, I was thinking to myself at the time, internally, I was a little defensive. It's like, you have no idea how my mornings go. I have three children to get ready to go drop off at three different places, get myself ready and uh, make it to work by 830 every morning. And I usually came in early. So it's like, you have no idea about my mornings. But I became convicted that what he was saying was true after I did that self-coaching and self-evaluation that I had to become a more positive, optimistic leader for my team. And so I started getting up an hour earlier than anybody else in my family. And that was really early back in those days. Um, and so that I could have time to reflect, to meditate, to pray, to work out, to get myself completely ready um, to face my team and to lead them through whatever you know, the issues of the day were, and it totally transformed my life and my leadership. It's a practice I continue every single day into today um, that's helped me be more effective. But I, two totally different approaches from two different leaders and styles about how they created change in me and it caused self-reflection and self-coaching, but both were extremely effective. Yeah, they got your attention, didn't they? Yes. In a good way. That's good. Hugh, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I, I do, because I, I was getting triggered by what 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 the aunt said, and you know, and I agree with it. You know, I was reflecting back on my early career, Lee, in in Arthur Anderson, which was a very results based environment, and I sped up through the uh, the management chain, if you want to call it that, because I was very reliable. I worked harder, and and my bosses knew. Uh, that I would get done what I had to get what had to get done and if they needed to they could throw me around the room a little bit and it would sort of incentivize me a little bit to come back better but I got away with that and and, and for a while working with those leaders because that was the culture but I think you know something that that Deanne was alluding to when she said there was you know she came to work for a different leader when I had to come and work with a different leader who, who, who saw me differently and, and had no experience with me, didn't know whether I was any good or not, that's when my, uh, if you want to call it my struggles, got exposed on, 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 on the relationship skills. And, you know, one of them particularly noticed that I was pushy at, to get, get my stuff done, but, you know, it was at the expense of, of, of feelings. And when I started to get that in a performance appraisal and realized that I was going to be actually held back because I hadn't developed that side of my leadership, that was the, that was the first big moment of awareness. And, you know, what I learned out of that was to be much more attuned to, okay, you can be on the speed train up and, 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 and you know, I don't want to say the pet, but on the speed train up, but you need to be listening to what the people elsewhere in the team might be saying so that so that you can adapt because you never know when one of them are going to be the leader and um you know that's imp that that's important but you know so so i suppose at the end of the day it was the, that was the, the big open not that i had the words right then but that was the big aha moment for me i had to balance my results drive and mission drive which is very strong as as you know <laughs> with with some relationship uh skills you know it's, so somewhere they became important yeah good well the uh, the whole idea of learning from 
both the positive and the negative experiences are very important. It gives us uh, the, that feedback, uh, helps us understand ourselves. I think though, going back to what I said earlier, and I want all the people out there in the audience to be thinking about this, the healthier you are as a person, the more easier it's gonna to be to adapt. So the more you can grow healthier, more self-secure, comfortable in your own skin, then the easier it'll be able, it'll be for you to adapt. Now, as a leader, one of the things I've spent a lot of time on now working with people and developing leaders is that on a, this uh, continuum of insecure to secure, we all slide back and forth. And you as a leader have the opportunity to help people move to being more secure, more comfortable in their own skin by believing in them, by encouraging them, but also holding them accountable. And of course, Deanne made it so clear that great leaders do both. Great leaders care about us, but they also hold us accountable. It's essential to do both. But leaders that can help their people slide over toward being more comfortable, more secure. And I think that's what she's saying that happened to her in her career. Her leaders really were doing that. And we want to be those kind of leaders. I think to uh, be aware of that, it really is also about being situationally aware. And so I thought it would be good to take a second and a minute or two and talk about situations and where you might have become more situational aware and were able to see the, see the playing field, see the picture, the politics, the resources, the individuals. And Deanne, did you, do you have a, 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 an example of where you saw the situation, you started to see them situations more clearly and be more intentional about being situational aware? Well, I think this is part of our leadership growth too, is recognizing you know, that um, we spend so much time learning about ourselves, you know, whether it's through like the leadership behavior DNA or the Myers-Briggs or we understand us, but how much time do we really understand how does this other person want to receive information? How does this other person, um, how are they likely to make decisions? And, and approaching every situation that way. Early in my career, I approached it from my own strengths. You know, I liked the bottom line first. So when I gave information to somebody, it, they were going to get the bottom line first. And then I expected them to answer or to ask me questions if they wanted something more. Well, I had to come to understand that some of the leaders that I was trying to get buy-in from, they wanted the chronological order. They wanted to know how I arrived at this bottom line. They didn't want the bottom line first. They wanted to know my steps. They wanted to know my thinking. And I couldn't understand why I wasn't getting the collaboration or the support that I wanted. And then the aha went off. It's like, well, this is a lot more work as a leader, but this is how somebody gets things done. They get things done by understanding how everyone that they have to collaborate with or build support from is wired. And they have to present information. They have to um, arrive at decisions. They have to uh, work with these people based on how they want to proceed rather than what's most natural to us. Yeah, that, that, that's so true. And I think we all, it's a big part of growing become, is being able to become more situationally aware and more others aware. And, but then again, that means that we're secure enough that we don't have to keep looking at ourselves. We can look outward and recognize that those people around us are the ones that we're really trying to help be successful through our efforts, whether they're beneath us or beside us or above us, we want them to be successful. If they're being successful, then we're being successful. And that's so helpful. You know, in thinking about uh, all of that, one of the things that's, that I remember, I, I can give an example. When I was a squadron commander, uh, one of the things I had, I had pictures on the wall of all my people and the people reported them. I would just sit at my desk in the morning and I would just look at them and say, okay, where are they? What do they need? And, but also how can I support them? I think that's kind of what you were saying. But I remember one time when uh, there was an airplane crash at another base and uh, it was the inst two instructors, I think in the particular airplane and they were doing something that was illegal maneuver. They shouldn't have been doing. And so because my squadron trained all the instructors, the IT and inspectors came and started uh, taking sworn testimony from our instructor pilots. 
Well, these guys had graduated before me or any of my instructors came into that squadron. It had been several years earlier. So I'm thinking, well, we didn't have anything to do with that. Why are they down here messing with us? It was because it was kind of breaking down the morale in our squadron a little bit. So I happened to be with my boss, the colonel, who was an ops group commander. And I, I said, hey, by the way, Colonel uh, so-and-so, I said, those guys are IG guys down there taking sworn testimony. It's a mess down there. They shouldn't be down there. And I, I'd like for you to help get them out of there. He looked at me and said, Lee, he said, anybody can steer the ship in calm waters. The real leaders take it through the storm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say another word. I said, <laughs> Thank you. And I got up and left. I went back to my office and I said, sometimes you're just not thinking things through from another perspective, the perspective of the whole command. And they needed to find out if there was a legacy in the squadron of that maneuver being done that gets passed down from one generation of instructors to another. But I wasn't seeing, I was just seeing it from a very narrow point of view. And it caused me to, um, it's a story, it's an example I never have forgotten that I was just so, I was so upset about. I think part of it was from my POW experience where interrogators were always trying to get you, you know, and the IG was down there interrogating people and it, without even realizing it, I didn't think about this till 10 or 15 years later, that probably had something to do with it, but it was still a great learning lesson to be more situationally aware of the situation as, you were, as we were talking about there. So yep. Kevin, Kevin, uh, go ahead. I was just saying, I, I, you know, it, that's a, it's a little intimidating, Lee, because I certainly don't have it, a life and death example. We were just a chicken business and, and I <laughs> didn't have one to compare to your story. But one of the things that I learned about this whole, both self-awareness and situational awareness, and you touched on it earlier about what people bring and this whole idea of, you know, um, when you see somebody that's a leader that is abusive even, or just not very skilled at, at managing people and having empathy. And um, usually what I say to myself is hurt people, hurt people. Mm -hmm. And so getting to the root of whatever that is, and it's interesting, you brought it up, your, your days of interrogation when you were, um, you know, as a POW certainly would come into mind in that situation. And I had situations like that. I had one employee who I was really having a problem because everybody that worked for this employee was constantly complaining about how she treated them. And I, I didn't know this person to be like that. It's like, I have to get to the bottom of this. And so we sat down to have a conversation and I started giving the feedback and I started talking about, I didn't suggest solu solutions. I just gave the raw feedback and she pulled out a pad and a pen and she started writing down, I can fix this. I can do this. I can do that. And I said, you're going to wear yourself out because this behavior, there's a root cause to all this. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's from five minutes ago or it's from, you know, 15 years ago, but there's something that's um, hurt you that's caused you to behave this way. And so my recommendation is, is to do the self-discovery, to go back and figure out what that is. And if you'll heal whatever that is, Mm -hmm. then all the correct behaviors will follow and you don't have to have a checklist because it'll become natural to who you are to treat people in, in the way that they want to be treated. Wow. That was great. Great leadership by you to see that and help that person understand that. But that, that exactly mirrors what I was talking about a while ago. It's a great example of it that uh, you said hurting people hurt people. And uh, we've all been hurt somewhere along the way. And the quicker we come to grips with that and deal with it, the more healthy we'll be at work and also very much so at home. My wife's a therapist and she deals with that every day. You know, marriages are going under so much because of baggage that people have they bring in. So, yes, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Kevin, do you have a, a polling question for us? I also wanted to check with uh, Hugh first. Hugh, did you have any input on that topic as well? I saw you nodding. Yeah, I, I was agreeing with what, what Deanne was saying and Lee, I think that, you know, just to keep it short, we all have personal trigger points. Um, I was in a meeting last week and, and some things went on there that, 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 that triggered, you know, if you want to call it what my, my piece of baggage is, but I'm aware of, of that and when it comes up. So I just told the seat and stay quiet. But 
um, you know, which again is part of self-coaching. But I think we all have those points and we've got to be able to uh, to manage ourselves through them when 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 they come up. Good. Yeah. Good point. Thank you. And and it just makes the point that we all we all have some of those. We have to become aware of them, self-awareness and situational awareness, and then coach ourselves in the moment to deal with that. Um, yeah, I, I was uh, I was coaching a guy in a company there in Atlanta, a large company, and really good guy. And he was the uh, head of sales and uh, group and did a great job. But he was so dominating and so verbal and just kind of control that he was con- trying to control the staff meetings and he wasn't the leader. Uh, his boss, the CEO or the president of that division. And so after coaching him for a couple of months, he called me one day and said, guess what? And I said, what? He said, after the meeting, one of my peers came up to me and said, "Uh, Mike, are you doing okay? Are you feeling okay today? And I said, sure. Why? He said, well, you were really different in the meeting today. You kept your mouth shut. (laughs) You didn't interrupt. You didn't try to control the meeting. That was really amazing. I just want to make sure that you're really okay. But he had become self-aware that what he was, his natural go-to behavior there was getting out of control and interrupting the staff meetings. And uh, then one of his teammates were kind of in a, given a, a backhanded pat on the back, you might say. Yeah. Um, so we have an anonymous poll question about self-awareness for the audience. Audience, if you'll, if you'll check out your screen, we're going to ask this question. So as an anonymous uh, survey, how effective have you been in the past regarding situational awareness? Be honest. It's an anonymous survey. We're just kind of curious about those in the audience today. How effective have you been in the past regarding situational awareness? Go ahead and place your answers. We'll end in a few seconds. Good. Interesting. All right. And the polling here, here are the results uh, that you gave. So 41% pretty good, good or acceptable. So I think that's a fair assessment for most of us regarding our situational awareness. Uh, any, any feedback from uh, the panel on uh, these results? I just think it's a lifetime process to continue to work on and coach yourself. I, I, I would be harsher about the results than what they reflect, of course. But, but of course, as humans, we always think we're better than we are. I don't think any of us who are, who are seasoned leaders would not have been very poor at some point, even if it was one or two instances, um, because otherwise you wouldn't have learned to be great yeah. or on the pathway to learning to be great. It, you, and, that, and that might be a blind spot. Um, I, and I, I think if everybody goes and thinks back hard about it, there are some situations where you've had a big miss. You couldn't have gone through life, um, whether it's being a leader in the business or at home or somewhere in the community without that miss. So um, no, no, one, no one rated themselves very poor, but let's, let, let's face it, all of us were very poor at, at some point, you know, in, in a couple of situations. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I've been, for in a lot of situations at home, I think my wife would probably say. Well, I, I think Lee, I would have been, but but I'm not saying I haven't been very poor, but having the, the, the behavioral systems and getting married later in life. So I got married later than you and probably clearly Deanne. Um, I think that was maybe was my good decision was to was to wait till later so that I was emotionally mature enough to be able to handle it and kids and, and all the emotions that go on with it um, and, and managing a team as well. You know, I think that, um, so I, I definitely know, but, but that's not saying I haven't made mistakes because I think we will always all continue to make some. Yeah. Deanne, I wanted to uh, ask about the whole idea of debrief. Uh, I don't know what, how you would look at it, your critique or just personal reflection back on what went well in that meeting, what didn't go well, how could I have done that better? Is that something that you developed early on and continue to improve on or how would, how did that go for you? Yeah, I, I didn't have a choice but to develop that skill um, because like Hugh just said, I made a lot of mistakes um, more earlier on than later, but I did. I made a, and I learned from those mistakes. It was why I wrote an entire chapter in Crush Your Career about how to navigate landmines so that maybe people could read about that and not experience some of the same things that I did and have to go through it quite the same way. 
Um, you know, we all need experience, but it doesn't necessarily have to be our own. We can learn from other people's experience too. And so that, um, I think that, so the debriefing process was really important because sometimes I was shell-shocked. I mean, I was just like, what just happened? Especially if you went into it without a, a certain self-awareness or certain situational analysis, uh, awareness. And so I would sit back and analyze you know, what did I, and that's how I learned about, I was taking an approach where I was taking my natural approach instead of communicating in a way that was how the other person wanted to hear information. That was a big aha for me that came out of a debrief. It's like, okay, why did that not work? Well, it's because you're not talking their language. You have to talk their language. Um, so that process for me was immediate and I did it in writing. I took notes. I kept all of my career, I kept a leather bound notebook with me. And really um, sometimes they were, I had all the digital things later in my career too, but that leather bound notebook was what I put my learnings in and the important things that I wanted to keep with me. And uh, I wrote those learnings down and I tried to do it differently next time. And of course, next time it might've been something else that I had to recognize change. But if you wanna make real change, it requires reflection and it requires um, returning again and again to that reflection to be mm -hmm. sure that you're making a habit change. Yeah, that I wrote down some words this morning when I was thinking about this and thank you so much. And I just, let me just say, I just admire because I know you're such a great leader, but to hear you talk about making those mistakes and learning from them, I think it's so powerful for all of us to hear that uh, you, there was a progression but you kept Absolutely. a notebook and you were committed. See, the words I wrote down this morning were wisdom. And I think you were seeking wisdom, the discipline, uh, the commitment to do that and stay with it. Uh, I think was so, so important. And you set a good example for that, you know, for all of us that you, you made a mistake, but you learned from it and you wrote it down and you disciplined, you reflected on it and you continued to, uh, coach yourself on how to actually perform better as a leader, which gave, I think, gave you more security and allowed you to be a giver to others even more, even though you held them accountable, you also were free to give a lot of caring and support to them. That didn't make you uncomfortable because you were okay with yourself. Well, reality, leadership is stewardship. And so to be a steward, those are some of the habits you really have to put into place um, and, you know, the better you become at it, the more opportunity you have to steward others. So um, start small and become a better steward and you have more opportunity from there. Yeah. Kevin, I think you have another polling question for you. And before we end up today, we want to talk just a little bit more about Deanne's book and what, what all is in that book. I want the audience to know about that a little bit more. Uh, so go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, it'll be fine. We do have another poll question audience, and this one is concerning others' awareness as an important aspect of self-coaching. So the survey is on your screen. How accurate is your others' awareness in personal and professional situations? Be honest in this anonymous question. How accurate is your others' awareness in personal and professional situations? All right, votes are coming in. Good. Thank you for your honesty. Good, we'll wrap this up in about five seconds. Good, sharing the results, there we go. Almost every time or occasionally or sometimes, almost never. So uh, those, are, those are some interesting uh, results on your other's awareness. So uh, what, I, what I get from this is we all have work to do <laughs> to be yeah. others aware in our situations every day in our work. You know, I, I think we've had a breakthrough today, uh, Lee. I think we've, we've got people to admit yeah, that they need to do some work, which is great. I think so too, but I think Deanne's uh, openness, I think really opens the door for us all to be more open about who we are and where we need to grow. So I really appreciate that, Deanne. You know, uh, thinking about all of this, is just, uh, it's very important for all of us to continue to grow. And I just think uh, it's a big part of what we're trying to do you in, in DNA behavior and leadership behavior DNA is to equip people with that to, those tools. And one of the big ones is being able to see graphically how you're different. 
you know, we're two standard deviations apart. That's a lot of difference. Deanne was talking about some people like the bottom line first, and some people like for you to start over here and lead up before how did you get to the bottom line? And that's a perfect example of differences. And I think last month we were, our webinar was on managing differences. And we talked about the platinum rule, and that's what Deanne was talking about. Do unto others the way they like to be done unto, the way they like to be communicated with, the way they like to be related with. And I told the story last month of the, of the fast-paced guys in this leadership team that were totally unaware of how they were blitzing and uh, destroying almost their patient people who couldn't handle that level of intensity. So this idea of being able to become others aware and being able to adapt your behaviors to work more effectively with them is a big, big part of self-coaching. You know, when you walk in that person's office, you got to think, okay, what is this person like and how can I communicate well with them? How can I give it to them the way they like it? You know, we had a saying in the military, when you had a, a new boss, you had to learn real quick what they wanted so you could give the dog what the dog wants to eat. <laughs> if he wants bullets, give him bullets. If he wants paragraphs, give him paragraphs. If he wants the bottom line, give him the bottom line because it's just going to help you be a lot more effective and coaching yourself to do that is, is really, really helpful. Uh, Deanne, comments on what we were just saying there. Well, absolutely. And, you know, I appreciate one of the things I, I actually went through the leadership behavior DNA recently, um, I had the opportunity to take that survey and I uncovered some things. I mean, here I am retired from my first career, uh, running my own business now. My children are grown and I've had insight. And, you know, we always have that insight um, as we grow. And uh, one of the funny things was, and Lee, you know, my youngest son. And when he looked at my report, um, that whole thing about being spontaneous, it, it has me as very spontaneous. He goes, mom, you've never been spontaneous because I'm always, what's the plan? Where are you going? When are you going to be back? Um, so it's, uh, it's true that we do have to understand ourselves and then understand what others want from us and mm -hmm. what they expect from us and, and that we communicate in those ways. And we use these tools and they'll be valuable to us all of our lives. They're not just something we start off with or when we get our first leadership assignment or when we get our our first, um, you know, big leadership C-suite level assignment. It's something that we constantly have to come back to. You know, I have to know how my clients want to be communicated to now and how they want to collaborate as much as I needed to understand that about my team and my peers when I was at Chick-fil-A. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Well, tell us a little bit about your new book, Crush Your Career, and uh, kind of the flow of that. Who's it for? And I, I said before, I think it's for everybody, but uh, tell us a little bit about why you came into writing that book and uh, how it can help people. Sure, absolutely. Well, Crush Your Career is really a companion to the last book that I released in September of 2019. Bet on Talent was uh, actually my second book. The first one, It's My Pleasure, it's out of print now. But Bet on Talent, How to Create a Remarkable Culture That wins the hearts of customers was written for leaders to understand how to find and keep extraordinary talent. And then Crush Your Career teaches talent how to be extraordinary. So this is the, the companion book, if you will, and it's, it's for every stage of career, certainly for those who are just starting their career. Um, it, the first half of the book is all about how to find a job. And then the second is how to keep your job and how to grow your career. And it follows the life cycle of employment from part-time jobs all the way through to thinking about retirement. So there's something in there for everyone, but um, most essentially, of course, um, is something to help those in your life who are in that, that process of they're getting a new job and they're trying to, uh, they need some help at how to interview, how to, um, navigate that path and that process. And then um, even later, uh, applying for a new job or promotion. My favorite chapter without question, and I mentioned a little earlier, is navigating landmines, because mm -hmm. that was really from my personal experience. And I know how important that is to, be, to know what to do if, if uh, you know, um, you have an abusive boss or what to do, you know, if you have a lack of self-awareness. There's a whole section on that in there. So um, that's what Crush Your Career is all about. As part of that, um, I released an eight episode podcast and that is called the Crush Your Career Podcast. The last of those episodes goes live tomorrow. All of them can be found on my 
um, website, deannturner.com, as well as information about those books and even some free downloads if you're interested. I'd love for anyone to connect with me there and on other social media platforms. That's good. Well, I uh, I remember reading that uh, the chapter you just referred to, and I, I thought, you know, this is so good for people who really haven't had a lot of experience in the workplace to be able to look ahead and see what life is like in the workplace, that these things happen. You know, it's a, it's not just a perfect world out there that this dynamics always going on. And I think your book kind of breaks into a number of those different areas that kind of give a person, especially a young person or a person changing jobs, a perspective of what the workplace is like. I think that's a powerful uh, view of it that you've provided for us. Thank you. So as we kind of start to wrap up here, I'd like to uh, circle back in terms of uh, self-coaching for a minute, the whole idea of self-coaching. Uh, I think you've heard the, the three of us say that we do it. Uh, we do it regularly. We try to work on it. We try to be disciplined about it because we're still growing. And I think it's just uh, something that we can pass along and to be thinking about how we can pass along that idea to others. So Hugh, what would you think would be a good way to pre present that to other people, maybe in your team or around you, even at home? I think I'd come back, Lee, to, to, to where I started around, just around energy flows. Mm -hmm. um, and just noticing when, when there's a shift in, 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 some, in somebody's energy flow, there's a blockage, it's feeling uncomfortable, you're feeling tired, they're feeling tired, they're, they're, someone's dodging a question, um, you know, flinching in some way, not being as forthcoming as they normally are. I think, it, it, I think it's watching for all the signals um, is, is, is important. And then bringing it back to the basics that, that we have really in our reports, which is what I've always done with people is to pull the report out and, and look at the strength and struggles and see and the communication keys and see where they've been, where they've been triggered. Um, and, and I've said that partly because there's some questions there in the chat box about uh, body language. And I think, you know, just being alert to all those things is, 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 is part of this, because that could be to, to Deanne's uh, point of landmines. That could be where a landmine is sitting. Um, and, you, and you don't know. It's not what necessarily someone says. It's, uh, you know, it's all the, other, all the other things that are going on. So I think, I think as a leader, you've, you, you've got to be you've got to be fresh all the time and highly observant. Yeah, good, good. Deanne, any thoughts? Well, just really what um, playing off of what Hugh just said is so important that he mentioned that body language piece um, when you're thinking about yourself coaching, because we have talked about words and we've talked about thinking, but sometimes though it doesn't align with what we look like at all. No, I think that's been one helpful thing about so many virtual meetings because you look up there and you see that look on your face and you're going, that look does not look like I'm engaged. That look does not look like I'm enthusiastic about what we're doing. And you didn't have that when you set meetings before that immediate feedback to yourself. But this is so important. I had a team member that literally very innocently, somebody misinterpreted some body language to be a really big deal and it almost derailed her career it was unfounded and unfair but nevertheless um it it took on a life of its own and i actually had to move her into another position um because of it it was like i said totally unfounded and unfair but nevertheless that's how those things work out in political environments right and so um being aware of that and being very conscious and i'm one of those people again that has to do that myself because if i'm not if I do not conscientiously smile when I'm talking to you, and it's probably happened on this webinar today, then I just have this natural look that doesn't look as happy as I look right this moment. So um, just being aware of that is an additional piece of uh, self-coaching is be, be, work on that body language um, so that you're communicating your enthusiasm and engagement for collaboration. Great points. You know, um... I am heavily involved in writing a new book right now, working with a co-author about uh, the working, the title is uh, uh, Captured by Love, The Inspiring Romance Stories of the Vietnam POWs. And we have about 20 chapters, 20 stories uh, of couples 
uh, some that stayed married the whole time there were POWs that came home. They've been married more than 60 years now. So a few that got divorced, they came home. Their wives had moved on, on during those years and they remarried and they have been married 45, 46, 47 years. And guys like me who came home single and uh, met somebody pretty quickly and got married and been married going on 47. My wife and I met uh, 47 years ago, uh, Friday night, this coming Friday night, Memorial Day weekend. And uh, as we pull those stories together, uh, looking at We've done some research into Gottman's seven principles of marriage. My wife's a therapist and does a lot of marriage counseling I mentioned. And then uh, Egret uh, Emerson's book, uh, Love and Respect, which is a great one on uh, marriage also. And I'm saying all that to say that all the stuff we're talking about here at work actually applies at home too. <laughs> and so uh, there was a time, once upon a time, some years ago when Mary and I were having some stress in our marriage and uh, we decided to go see a marriage counselor. And we went to see, she, of course, she knew who the best one in Atlanta was and we went to see him. And as we talked, what it came to be is that we were getting into power struggles because we both wanted to be right about something. <laughs> and, and that was just kind of, it just kind of goes around and around. It get, every time you go around that circuit, it gets stronger. You know, her words are what actions cause me to feel. My words are action. So it's a circle and you have to break it. And what I realized was that it was easy to break if I would just go to her, sometimes I had to back away and just go calm myself down. I go back and I'd say, you know, this is really my fault. And I would take ownership for everything I could possibly think of that I could have done that would have caused that disagreement. And the minute I took ownership for it, it took away, it just broke the struggle because how is she going to, she could beat on me and say, yeah, you're right, you're right. But usually what happened, because she's a good person, she said, well, you know, I had some ownership in there too. And she would take ownership and all of a sudden the power struggle evaporated. And that was probably 15 or 20 years ago. We don't have power struggles anymore because I'm self-aware and she's self-aware. And if we see ourselves start to go around that circle, I just move away and come back and say, you know what? This is my fault. I did this wrong. I said the wrong thing, whatever, whatever. And, but that going back, I'm going back to energy now, you can tell you're starting to get into that when you start to see a person's energy. The same thing is true at work. People get in power struggles at work. Just take ownership for your part, every bit that you can possibly claim and you free others up to own what they can own. And I think that's a real powerful piece of self-awareness and others' awareness that we can all use too. So I'll throw that out as a freebie, but we'll have more information on the marriage book later this summer. Kevin, can you tell us about anything else? Uh, we're good. Thank you so much, Deanne, for your time today. Thank you, audience. Please remember Crush Your Career, her book at dnturner.com, and you will receive an on-demand recording of this webinar after we finish today. So guests, thank you so much for your time. Audience, thank you for your time, and we hope it was helpful to, to you today. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Take care. Thank you, thank thank you. you Deanne. Thanks, Lee, Kevin. Thanks, everybody, for listening.